from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike, and I'm online, and I'm live with you today. This is the talk show Hell Hates. The more you listen, the more you know why. I found something wonderful in my Bible reading today, and I'm going to share it with you. Um, I've, I've asked God to just put the joy of the Word back in me the way it was years ago. And when God called me um, to study prophecy, 1997, uh, somewhere in November, um, and God just, you know, affirmed in me, Mike, just read the Bible. That's what I started doing. Now, I had been, I grew up in Sunday school, grew up in church, went to a Christian school for two years, uh, seventh and eighth grade, went to three years of Bible college, and was required as a freshman the every every freshman at this particular college had to take um, a course called the, a literary study of the English Bible. And first semester was Old Te- Testament, second semester New Testament. And we had to sign a thing saying we had read the Bible. I didn't. I signed it, but I didn't. I didn't read all of it. And then after I got married, got into uh, the ministry um, in 1990, I pastored my first church, little town of Richwoods, Missouri. I'd get up every morning. I'd try to read the Old Testament and, you know, 536 o'clock in the morning. I'm just not just not getting it. But 1997, 98, 99, 2000 and after, I mean, God just opened up the word to me and I, I just, I couldn't get enough. It's like the floodgates had opened. They, they raised the, the gates on the dam and was letting all this water out. And that's what God was doing. He was just pouring things in me and after a while, you know, things settled down somewhat, but, um, you know, everybody needs a Bible revival. And if you ask God to give you one, he will. And reading the Bible then won't be something you make yourself do. You wake up in the morning going, boy, I can't wait to get get in that book and find things out that I don't know. And I am dead serious. I have cut down tremendously um, going to these news websites. Um, Every now and then I look at Drudge Report to look for like some tech news, what's going on in technology, maybe a few UFO reports. Um, the Liberty Daily, but I have found also that as as the Drudge Report had now has leaned to the left, and some of the news on there is slanted left. The Liberty Daily is an, is a far right website, and some of the news that that they link to are extreme right-wing conspiracy theory and I'm just pulling away from that. I don't trust what I read on the internet anymore. I don't trust it. I'm not saying everything's a lie, but I would rather know things from the Word of God 
than to believe things on the internet that are not true. I preached on this at Pea Ridge, Arkansas, and admitted that I fell into some lies that I believed about Trump. Things that, when I look back now, I'm going, they weren't true. So, you know, you get spanked, and God corrects you, and you just got to go back to doing what's right. And I want to encourage you, strongly encourage you to have a Bible revival and get back into your study of the Word of God. Don't count on me. Don't depend on me. They are censoring people. The platforms, at some point, we all have this idea that maybe they'll shut all conservative talk down. Who knows? It could happen. And if it does, then I'll just trust the Lord on what to do after that. But I've found, I found, every time I just open this book, I find wonderful things in here. Or I remind myself, this is the Bible that I had in 1997. And it's got a lot of underlinings in it. It's got a lot of notes in it, words that I wrote down, things. What, when I look back at some of them now, I go, what did I mean by that? I have no idea. But it's fun to go back and study and relearn some of the things that you learned years ago. Jeremiah chapter 30. Let's get into the Word of God today. And I'm going to do, um, do some of this, and I'm going to answer. I'm going to continue what I did Sunday night. Sunday night I was answering questions that people had. And so if you have a question about something related to Bible, Bible prophecy, things like that, uh, the email address is pastormikeonline at gmail.com. I don't know if that's somewhere on the screen. It might be. Yeah, right, right there. Pastormikeonline at gmail.com. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel saying, write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. And people, I'm telling you, there is no greater thing that God has ever done for us than to give us his written record of his word. Don't trust latter-day prophets. Don't trust dreamers of dreams. Don't trust people who say they've had visions. Don't trust these people. They may not be lying. I don't know, but you don't know that either. What we know beyond any doubt whatsoever is that everything that God said was important is in this book, period, the end. He told Moses, write this down. He told John, write this down. He told Ezekiel, write this down. He tells Jeremiah, write this down, Jeremiah, in a book. We know the story of Jehoiakim. Jeremiah the prophet writes out a prophecy against him. He sends it, has it sent over to King Jehoiakim. He reads three or four leaves. So it was papyrus. He reads three or four of them, takes a knife, a pen knife, and cuts them up and throws them into the fire. There. Now, that stuff will never happen. Jeremiah, God is like, boy, you shouldn't have done that. Because not only am I going to give give Jeremiah the words again that I gave him the first time, because God has a really good memory. I'm going to add more to it this time. You can count on it. And that's exactly what he did. I I went to the website of a guy that was speaking at 
a couple of the conferences that I had spoken at in the past. It wasn't the Red River one. And his doctrinal statement was so totally out there, especially when it came to Bible, the Bible. He said, you'll not find anywhere where God said, take, uh, take all of my words and write them down in a book. And I'm going, well, he said it right here to Jeremiah. Why, does, why is it important that what God said must be written down so that it can be preserved? You and I both know that transmitting a conversation that was had to somebody else, you never get it exactly right, ever. So God said, write it down. That way it's preserved. Courts of law like documents. They love written things. They love pieces of paper. Contracts that are written down are enforced because, and the words that are on those papers are enforced because they're written down, agreed upon, people sign them or seal them or however, but they're written down and courts use that. That's better than oral testimony. Because it is a written, un you cannot erase ink. It is an unchangeable record. And my friends, we have an unchangeable record of every word that God said. And if it's important, it's in this book. And if it's not important, some people look for things or have ideas or theories and conspiracy theories and you know what about this and and I'm going if it's not in the bible that's God's way of telling you it's not important move on look at what is in the bible um Verse 3, for lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. I love that. God is a God of second chances. After all that Israel did to God, after all the Jews are doing to God now and have been since Christ, since before Christ, what they did to Paul, what they did to Peter, what they did to Stephen. All of the Jews and their grotesque religious practices that they brought in from Babylon and Sumeria and Canaanites and the Hivites, and they borrowed all of these pagan ideas and wove them into Kabbalah. God still says, I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to love them in the last days. Um, he loves them now. Verse 4, And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. We're kind of in those days, right? Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Think of the pale horse that comes in Revelation chapter 6. For it shall, I don't know the connection, but I think there is. For it shall come to pass in that, and this is what I wanted you to do. Go Get the... Uh, King James Pure Bible Search Software. I'm going to put it up on the screen. You'll have, you'll have so much fun doing things like this. You won't even want to watch TV anymore. You won't, you won't want to look at Facebook, YouTube, nothing. In verse... Seven, he says, alas, for that day is great. And I wrote down in my Bible years ago the phrase, that day. Let's type that in. 
226 times in the in the whole Bible. However, 22 times exactly in the New Testament. And that's the number for revelation. And look at look at it. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? 2246, Matthew, and no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Matthew 24, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. Matthew 26, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Matthew, Mark 13, but of that day and the hour knoweth no man. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, but ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. And then you can add the Old Testament and go back and look. And I'm telling you, just simple phrases like that, you study them, and it, it will just, you're, you, you, will, you will get doodads going up. You'll cry tears. You'll see things you have never seen before. God will give you thoughts in your mind. He'll lead the Holy Spirit. It will be sitting there in your chair while you're reading these things. And again, we're living in a time right now where we can be better Bereans than the Bereans ever were. Because for them to search the scriptures meant unrolling large volumes of books. Literally. Reading them one verse after another. And in, and in those days, I guess they were used to it, but there were no spaces between the words. They had to know where one word started and where that word ended, and they had to be able to read that. We now have it made so easy for us to open up the treasure chest of God's word and we won't do it for what? Well, I know what the reason is. The devil doesn't want you to do it. He doesn't want you to know these things. He wants to keep you an idiot. He wants to keep you in ignorance. He wants you chasing your tail, looking at things on the internet. Oh my goodness, this is happening. Oh my goodness, that is happening. Oh no, this conspiracy theory. Oh no, that conspiracy theory. And I still believe in conspiracies. But the ones that I trust the most are the ones that I find in the Bible and, and can prove things using Scripture. I got an email today from somebody that it was, they, they'd sent it out to I don't know how many different people. And it was written in there, I don't need some pastor to tell me blah, blah, blah. And I'm not going to say what it was about. But it that was obviously directed at me. Obviously. And I'm just going, I think you people are chasing your tails. Looking in the wrong place for the wrong thing. When you could be studying and discerning God's word instead. That's what I think. So, write, jot that down, that phrase, that day, and just, just go through the, just start at the beginning and look at it all through the scriptures and have all kinds of fun with it. Because I promise you, you will. And then... Maybe along the lines, you'll see some other word that capture your attention. Write it down. When you get done with that day, then look up that other word or that phrase. And I, I mean it. You will, you will literally, your life will be changed. Food will taste better. 
I promise you, your life will be better. Um, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And again, to the gentleman who criticized me because he thought I followed um, John Hagee's version of how Israel is going to be saved. John Hagee believes that they're going to be saved by doing animal sacrifices again. I do not believe that at all in any way, shape, or form. I believe, and I read it again today, Jeremiah 31. God just said, poof, I'm going to forgive your sins one day. Just like that. For doing nothing, I'm going to wipe away all of your sins and your transgressions. I'm going to make a new covenant with you that's not going to be the Mount Sinai covenant. It's going to be a different one. And we know what that covenant is. It's the New Testament. So I, I still don't know what he finds objectionable about my belief about Israel, but I believe God's going to save them. There is a time of Jacob's trouble coming. And the word trouble is linked biblically with the word tribulation. You can do that study too. Look at all the places in the Bible where the word tribulation is used, and you'll see tribulation and trouble. So God's linking them together. Verse 8, for it shall come to pass in that day, he says it again, saith the Lord, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king whom I will raise up unto them. Now we know that this isn't David brought back to life. We know this is Jesus Christ. So one of the names of Christ, and Christ has many names in the Bible. King of kings, Lord of lords, Prince of peace, wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father. And in this particular, the lamb, Emmanuel, Christ, Messiah. Here, he's David, a man after God's own heart. Think of um, think of think of all the men in the Bible that were that were God's men. Especially the, the Bible writers themselves, like David. Each character in the Bible portrays a certain aspect or character of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is Solomon with his wisdom. There is nobody wiser than Jesus Christ. David, the mighty man of God, the strong uh, captain of the host, the man who fears no giants whatsoever, a man after God's own heart, is David. He is a picture uh, that that aspect of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you just take all of these men in the Bible, especially the ones who wrote scriptures. Moses, Jesus is the lawgiver, but he's the new lawgiver, the mediator. So every man in the Bible is a is either going to be a picture of Christ or antichrist. So you take somebody like um, Absalom, David's son, who had the hair of a woman, face of a man. Think about it. Gen uh, Revelation 9, he had this long, long hair, and he's riding on a mule and gets his hair caught in the thicket of an oak tree and he's hanging there cursed is anyone who hangeth from a tree okay he's a picture of antichrist because he's trying to steal the throne of david so anyway 
Uh, verse 10, therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel. Think about this. If God said, fear thou not, when somebody tells me, Mike, don't be afraid, I'm, I, I am, I'm not going to go, oh, okay, Whew. well, I'm glad you said that because I was really afraid until you said that. It doesn't work. But if God does it, if God says to you, be not afraid, you know what will happen? You won't be afraid. And I'll show you that in a minute. Therefore, fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none, here it is, none shall make him afraid. That's what I wanted to show you. I've, I've been telling people, and I tell myself this, because I, I deal with, Anxiety every now and then, sometimes depression, great fear, and it just comes out of nowhere. Sometimes it can be related to events that are happening. Sometimes it just is there. Whether, whether devils cause it or it's just something in my body that isn't right or my mind that isn't right and devils are taking advantage of it they're there and they start telling me things and whispering things and saying things and making me think things and I don't like it and I have told people in and I've my testimony about being electrocuted in 2006 when that was happening I was praying, even though I could not move, I could not see, I could not breathe. I was praying in my mind. And I'm so glad that we are given salvation by grace without works, because I'm telling you, when you've got whatever the voltage was going through your body, you can't do any good works. You can't do any bad ones either. The, the, the electricity was so powerful. I had, it was my favorite phone in the world. It was a flip phone. And I loved that phone. And I had that phone just in my pocket. And the current going through me was so strong that it burnt that phone up in my pocket. It just destroyed the screen and nothing would come up. And I've asked God, the next time, God, that it's going to be my, when, it, when it's really going to be my day to die, I do not want to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid. And I believe, right here, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 10 Jacob shall return and shall be in rest and be quiet and none shall make him afraid. And that's what I believe. I believe that when the time comes, if we are under persecution or if something is going to happen, something bad, something terrible, that God will speak peace to us and we'll have it. I've experienced that before. It's wonderful to not be afraid when normally you would. Verse 11, For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations whither I have scattered uh, thee. Yet I will not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether un punished. I do believe that God chastens his children. That's how he deals with sin in us Christian folk. Now, if you don't want God's punishment, you don't get his inheritance. It's that simple. 
people who play church, false brethren, all kinds of unsaved people, whether they're pew members, deacons, or pastors. They are unsaved because they refuse God's chastening. I actually read the website of a church. Uh, it was their doctrinal statement. They were hyper-dispensationalists. And they admitted on their website that they only followed the doctrine that was contained in the known writings of the Apostle Paul, Romans, and I think they didn't include Hebrews in it. And they said in their doctrinal statement that they do not believe because Paul said, I come not to be bab I come not to baptize. They said, we don't believe you have to be baptized. They also said, we do not believe that God corrects us as sons because we are not saved that way. That's for Israel. And I'm going, I know what you are, according to Hebrews 12. And if you want to know what I th know they are, you go read Hebrews 12. There's a word in there. That's what they are. They were admitting that they don't believe that. And I'm just going, anybody who does not let God correct them, they don't get an inheritance. That is God's way of dealing with our sins. Uh, verse 12, for thus saith the Lord, the, thy bruise is incurable and thy wound is grievous. That's the wound and the bruise of sin in the flesh. There is none to plead thy cause that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. All thy, and, and by the way, people, healing medicines. Some people want me to preach against f going to the pharmacy. Why would I? Does God say that medicine, balms, things like that, did God say they were evil? Did God say they were a sin? No. He never said that. Well, you know, in, in the Greek, in Revelation, the sorcery is pharmakia. Yeah, I know that. And I know also that in witchcraft and Wicca and sorcery, they made intoxicants, things that made you high or drunk. But you don't assume that everything that is medicine is evil. Because God doesn't say that. God even, God even gave a, the allowance to use the alcohol in wine for, he told Tim, Paul told Timothy, use a little, little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. The book of Proverbs, he says uh, to give strong drink and wine to those who are ready to perish. Or those who are in severe depression. I know I'm paraphrasing that, but there, there is a limited use of that for ailments. So it's people ask, people send me emails. Why don't you preach or make comments? Why don't you preach against pharmaceuticals? Because I don't think they're all bad. I don't think they're all evil. Some of them, eh, uh, verse 14, all thy lovers have forgotten thee. They seek thee not, for I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one, for the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased. And I want you to think about the history of the Israel people, the Jewish people, since Christ. They have been run out. They have been killed. They have been tortured. They've been persecuted. Think of what Hitler did, World War II. I want to show you something in a minute. Verse 15, Why criest thou for thine affliction? Thy sorrow is uncurable for the multitude of thine iniquity. Because thy sins were increased, I have done these things unto thee. 
Therefore all they that devour thee shall be devoured, and all thine adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity, and they that spoil thee shall be a spoil, and they that prey upon thee I will give thee for I will give for a prey. Look up videos and pictures of Berlin before Hitler and immediately after nineteen forty five or right at 1945. Berlin had been bombed nearly out of existence. Hitler's hatred and others, uh, the, the German people in general, their hatred of the Jews, their cities were magnificent cities before World War II. And after World War II, they were turned into wastelands by Allied bombing raids. We bombed practically every major city in Germany, the Allies did in World War II. What Hitler did as far as the Jews and other people that he did that he hated that he didn't like his thousand year Reich his desire to rule over most of Europe and he wanted America too it cost the German people everything and when if you study that history when you know that when the Allies finally got to Berlin, they took over and they divided Germany up and there was East Germany for years in West Germany and the Allies made sure that Germany would never wage war on the world again. That was their punishment for going against God's people. Verse 17, For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord, because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tents, and have mercy on his dwelling places. Somebody say amen. And the city shall be builded upon her own heap, and the palace shall remain after the manner thereof. And out of them shall proceed thanksgiving, and the voice of them that make merry. And I will multiply them, and they shall not be few. And I will also glorify them, and they shall not be small. Their children also shall be as aforetime, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all that oppress them. And their nobles shall be of themselves, and their governor uh, shall proceed from the midst of them, and I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach unto me, for who is this that engaged his heart to approach unto me, saith the Lord? Ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. I love that! Man, I love that. And by the way, we also are the Israel of God by second birth, by faith. We are the seed of Abraham by faith. These things also apply. God is our God. We are his people. Don't ever forget that. Don't forget your identity, your heritage, who you are. Who, who is your God? Don't ever forget that. Some people are an American first, or a British man first, or an African first, or whatever. I am a Christian first and foremost. I am an American second. I do not put my country. Paul said, for here we have no continuing city. We have no, there's nothing on this earth that lasts. If I watch TV, I watch old TV shows. Leave it to Beaver, Dragnet, stuff like that. Those days aren't coming back again, and I know it. 
There is no continuing city here. I have one in heaven. So I'm a citizen of heaven first. I'm a member of God's kingdom first, and I seek his kingdom first. And all these things shall be added unto you. Put him, be God's people, and let God be your God. Behold, verse 23, behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury and a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he have done it and until he have performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days, ye shall consider it. Now, remember what I said about the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea. And this is what I didn't understand years ago when I'm trying to read the Old Testament. And I'm just like, why am, I, why am I reading this? This has already happened. There is a partial fulfillment. God speaketh once. A perfect fulfillment. God speaketh twice. Think of, okay, let's look at, um, actually... You're right there in Jeremiah. Look in Jeremiah 31, 15. Here is a verse of scripture that has had a partial fulfillment. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rahel, Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Now, we know that this was performed in the book of Matthew, when Herod, having heard from the wise guys, the wise men, that a savior was born, the king was born, Jesus. And he's like, uh, I'm not going to let this kid live. He's not going to take my throne. Where is he that is born so that I may worship him as well? But he was lying through his teeth. So when the wise men didn't return back and tell him where it, he was, he had every child under the age of two years old, every male child, killed, slaughtered for no reason. Because he was trying to kill the one that would be king. Same thing with Moses, right? The Egyptians, Pharaoh's going to kill all the firstborn males of, uh, or all the newborns. But he missed Moses. And Moses was the one that God used to lead his people out of bondage. So we know that Jeremiah 31, 15 has a partial fulfillment. But keep reading. Verse 16, thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself. Thus thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, and I repented. And I repented. And after that I was instructed. I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. And you just keep reading, and there are things here that God hasn't done yet. But he's going to. And this is why you go back and look at Jeremiah 30, verse 24. In the latter days, ye shall consider it. Everything in this book is going to be performed exactly. I was going to, I was going to take you to uh, Joel. Uh, but we can go to the book of Acts, get the same thing. In the book of Acts, chapter 2. We have evidence of this. Um, in verse 14 of Acts chapter 2, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judah, see, there's eleven. He mentions the number eleven. Now, Matthias has already been added 
to replace Judas Iscariot. So there's 12 apostles. But why does the Bible now mention that there's 11 here? Well, it's Peter and the other 11 apostles. Why doesn't he, why does it use the number 11? Because that number is a number for confusion, especially of languages. And what happened in Acts chapter 2? God is actually sending a sign to Israel. Remember what Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 14 about tongues. Tongues are for a sign. To them who believe not. So on the day of Pentecost, you have all these people speaking known languages. Known languages. And people are understanding the word of God in their tongue, in their language. And it's a sign to Israel. Israel is the one. The Jews are the one who don't understand. It's like when Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Is he calling for Elijah? They had no idea. He had just quoted Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They had no idea. So it was a sign to them that God was going to put them in chaos, confusion, not understanding on the day of Pentecost. That's why he stood up with the 11. Anyway, um, he said, um, Peter stood standing up with the 11, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judah and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose. They're not drunk. Seeing it is but the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now look at what he says here. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Ladies, quote scripture. Prophesy away. Post scripture on Facebook. Send them out in text messages. Prophesy away. You have the right to declare what the Word of God says. Amen. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I, shall, I will shew wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Now, God certainly poured out his spirit on that day, but there was no blood, no fire, no vapor of smoke. The sun was not darkened. The moon did not turn to blood. The stars did not withdraw their shining. They didn't, a third of them didn't fall on the day of Pentecost. So do we just say, well, that must have been um, um, a metaphor. Yeah, that's it. It's a metaphor. No. What it means is the prophecy is only partially fulfilled. It will be perfectly fulfilled. Because we know in Revelation 6, when the sixth seal is opened, dun dun dun, that the sun's going to be darkened. Moon's going to be turned to blood. A third of the stars are going to fall. They're going to withdraw their shining. And everybody's going to freak out on that day, except us. So, God speaketh once, partial fulfillment. God speaketh twice, perfect fulfillment. Um... Let's see here. What, what time is it? Let me go to Jeremiah 31. And here in a little bit, I'll look at my emails, maybe answer some of your questions. Um, Jeremiah 31, 31 is the promise of the new covenant. 
Paul references this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made so to all the Hebrew roots people. You're dead wrong. Dead. Spiritually dead wrong. If you think that God sent his only begotten son who is in the express image of God himself to this earth to suffer and die an agonizing death to bleed out literally the earth opening her mouth to take in his blood because there was an earthquake on the day when Jesus was crucified and the, the ground opened up. Remember that? Just like Abel. So if you think that God sent his only begotten son to this earth to suffer and die and be sh and have the shame and reproach on him simply to turn us back to Moses, you're a liar. You're a liar. You know nothing. In fact, you don't even use the term New Covenant or New Testament. You change it and call it the Renewed Covenant. See, it sounds the same. Sounds similar. Oh, it's the renew Oh, it's the Renewed Covenant. So we have to go back and keep as much of the law as we possibly can, right? wrong. Look at what God said. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I had made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord, God had betrothed Israel but he wrote her a bill of divorce and cast her aside. Verse 33, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the, with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And what do they do to earn this? Not a thing. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. From the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. God's going to do that. And for what reason? Love. Same reason I forgive my wife of things. Same reason she's forgiven me of things. Same reason I forgive my children. Same reason my children have forgiven me. You forgive people when you love them. When you just love somebody, even when they do wrong, you just forgive them. That's what, that's what having a family is like. That's what the family of God is supposed to be like, people. You just forgive people. Forget about it and move on. You don't keep bringing it up. You don't hold it against them. You don't, I'll forgive you. I'll never forget it. Yeah, I know we can't, it's not possible to forget what's been done. But if you start acting upon an offense, then you really haven't forgiven. 
God is not going to act upon anything that I've done except to chastise me to bring godly sorrow which brings repentance. But God is not going to hold the grudge against me and put me in double jeopardy and say, well, you know, on second thought, I'm going to send him to hell anyway. I, I cannot tell you how thankful I am for the grace and the mercy of the loving Father that I have. If he can forgive me, if he can forgive you, he can forgive Israel. He can forgive anybody he wants. And why he does it? It is because of his great love that he has for us. One more thing. Jeremiah 32, which is the 777th chapter of the Bible. And you'll find that out when you go. I'll show you how to do this. You just, um, let me do that. You just click. Go like, okay, so let's go to the, um, let's go to the Old Testament and click chapter. And you can type one in or you can just scroll and go to 777. Jeremiah 32. And I wrote, I have it wrote, written down here, 777, and I have an arrow pointing at chapter 32. The beauty of this chapter is, and I want you to open your Bible and I want you to read along, is that there's part of New Testament doctrine that is linked right in with this. And the very words that are spoken in Jeremiah 32. This is why, this is reason 1,912 of why I only read the King James Bible. Because you get a consistency of the language throughout. Some people say, well, I like to get all the translations. I look at all the different translations and, and I see, and, 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 there, and you get confusion because all of them have to be different according to copyright laws. All of them have to be significantly different than the others. And in many of those, um, in many of those, the, the verses are missing. Um, somebody sent me, a list of verses that are missing out of the um, English Standard Version. Now, the English, the ESV is sort of taking over the, the fame that the NIV had. When, when back in the 80s, 90s, and aughts, 2000s, churches were using the NIV who were not using the King James. Now they're moving over to the English Standard Version, the ESV. And uh, this person sent me a list of verses. Matthew 17, 21. Uh, what does that say? Matthew 17, 21 is, How be it this kind goes not out but by prayer and fasting. Matthew 18, 11, Matthew 23, 14, Mark 7, 16, Mark 9, 44, Mark 9, 46, Mark 11, 26, Mark 15, 28, Luke 17, 36, Luke 23, 17. Verses, gone. Partial verses or whole verses, gone, completely gone. Wiped off the Bible like they don't belong there. Because the best manuscripts say don't don't have this verse. Well, they took them out because they didn't like it. Anyway, what was I talking about? Oh, the the flow of the Bible of having one consistent translation, so that the wording between the Old Testament and New Testament, even though you have some forty different authors 
writing in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, translated by one. Let one interpret, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and let one interpret. And this is it. So in Jeremiah 32, Jeremiah, unfortunately, is in prison. Why is he in prison? Uh, because he said to uh, the king Zedekiah, Nebuchadnezzar had surrounded Jerusalem. Zedekiah wanted to know if Jerem if uh, Jerusalem was going to be taken by the king of Babylon. And Jeremiah said, thus saith the Lord, yeah, he's, it's going to be taken. Zedekiah didn't like it. So what did he do? Throw him in prison. So he's in prison. And the word of the Lord comes to him and says, your cousin is going to come. Your uncle's son is going to come and he's going to offer you a piece of property. I want you to buy it. So, in verse, I'll just pick it up in verse 10 for time's sake. So, I, verse 10 of Jeremiah 32. So I subscribed the evidence and sealed it and took witnesses and weighed him the money in the balances. He's got two copies now of the title deed. Where the landmarks are. It goes from this creek to this post to this fence, to this road. They subscribed it all out. They wrote it all out. If you've ever seen a deed to a parcel of land, it describes trees, rivers, fence posts. It describes everything. It gives you the coordinates of land. So he has two copies, one sealed, one unsealed. Think about it. The 27th book of the Old Testament is Daniel. It's sealed. 27th book of the New Testament is Revelation. It's unsealed. Isn't that cool? You see it? So he, he, verse 11. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom and that which was open, old and New Testament. <sighs> and I gave the evidence of the purchase unto Barak, the son of Neriah, the son of Maasiah, in the sight of Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book. The book. I love it. He tell, told Jeremiah, that's how we started this out in Jeremiah 30. Jeremiah. Take the words that I say to you and write all these words in a book. The word book or books. Let me show it to you. I, uh, folks, I just love my King James Bible. Book. Asterisk. There's only two versions, book or books. 196 times. You know what that is? 49 times 4. It's 7 times 7 times 4. Jesus Christ. 196 times. 7 times 7 times 4. Are you kidding me? I'm not done. Son of man. 196 times, 49 times 4, 7 times 7 times 4, all three of them. Book or books, Jesus Christ, Son of Man, all found the exact same number of times. It's a fact. It's a fact. Now, if that fact disturbs you or you roll your eyes... Or you say, well, that's numerology, that's witchcraft. I just told you a fact, and I think that it tells me that my Bible is in order, and God 
ordered and structured and numbered and coordinated and put everything in its proper place in my Bible. That's what I think about it. So then he said, verse 11 again, so I took the evidence, no, verse 12, uh, I subscribed the, the Subscribe the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. Now, why did God want him to buy this property? Because, remember, he had told Zedekiah, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar, he's going to come in. He's going to burn his city down. He's going to steal everybody out of it. They're going to be gone 70 years into Babylon because we're, we have not done right. But God wanted, listen to me now. Have you ever had God angry at you? Yes. I've had times where I said, God, you probably need to whip me for that. And he did. But God wanted Israel to know. By, by the, these two books, the one sealed and the one open, I want you to know something. I made a promise to your father, Abraham. I made a promise to his son, Isaac. I made a promise to his son, Jacob. And I've made a promise to all your fathers, the 12 tribes, that even though I'm angry with you now, and I'm going to put you in captivity, I'm going to bring you back. And I want the evidence that I'm going to do that written down in the form of Jeremiah buying this parcel of land. It's his right to redeem it. That's his cousin. His cousin is selling it. He does have a right according to the law to redeem it. And he's going to redeem it. And I'm going to redeem you. So look at what he said. So verse 13 I charge Barak before them, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed and this evidence which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel, that they may continue many days. What is an earthen vessel? Second Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You see the language? See the, the connection? I, I'll never forget when I read this and I read that phrase and put them in earthen vessels. I went... Before, we're the earthen vessel. We have this, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Turn to Ephesians 1. You'll see the language. Verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed, just like that book in Jeremiah, in the 777th chapter of the Bible. You were sealed, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of it. Are you seeing this? This matches perfectly with Jeremiah 32 and the evidence both which is sealed and not sealed. He put them in an earthen vessel. People like me and people like you. People who are made of dirt who have no significance whatsoever in this world. We're not famous. We're not brilliant. We're not powerful. We're not millionaires, billionaires. We're just plain 
people. Nothing. We're sinners. And yet God took his most valuable treasure and put it in such an unobvious place that no one would dare to look there. Put it in us, earthen vessels, until the day of the redemption of the purchased possession. That's what he was talking about in Jeremiah 32. He bought that field in Anathoth from Hanamiel, his cousin. And the evidence was, and he said in back in Jeremiah 32, he said, houses and lands and vineyards shall be bought again in this land. In other words, I'm bringing you back and you're going to own this land again. I'm going to give it back to you. But I have to teach you a lesson. But I'm not going to forsake you. I never will. That's the God I serve. I, I just... I tell him thank you all the time. I keep asking forgiveness for old sins. I know he's already forgiven me, but I just want him to know I'm still sorry. I'm still thankful that God has sealed me and gave me a second chance. And then he was angry with me for a while. But he gave me another chance. He'll give you one too. If you'll ask him for it. Be the greatest thing ever happened in your life. Because you see, there's a theme in the Bible. Remember I said how God speaketh once, yea, twice. There's a partial fulfillment, a perfect fulfillment. Well, in the Bible, like, there's a, it's a picture of like, life and death and resurrection and once we're resurrected are we going to sin anymore no 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 once we're resurrected that's permanent we're stuck being god's people and that's how he does it so i grew up reading this old bible and then i would, walked away from it and I got out in the wilderness and God brought me back and when he put this back in me I'm telling you I'm never walking away from this book what God does the second time he always does it permanent it's for sure let me take a look and see what's on your mind. Uh, this came in from Sunday. Uh, thank you, Pastor Mike, for taking questions. Isaiah 66, 23, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Isaiah 66, 24, And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Does this take place during the thousand-year reign or in heaven? Here's, here's what I believe. Let's go back to uh, this. Let's go look at Isaiah 66, okay? Um, he actually mentions in Isaiah 66 that this is in the new heaven and the new earth which happens after the thousand year reign so he says it in verse 22 for as the new heavens and new earth which I will make shall remain before me saith the Lord so shall your seed and your name remain now here's what's going to happen He's going to make this new heaven and new earth. Before he does that, he resurrects. It's called the second resurrection. He resurrects all of those who are doomed and damned. And I'm not trying to curse, but that's the word. He resurrects them and gives them an everlasting body. Because... 
this flesh, we know that it can be burnt into literally ashes. My brother-in-law is an embalmer, and he owns a crematorium, and I've seen cremains, they call them. And there's nothing but ash left. So the physical body can be burned up in just a matter of hours, and there's nothing left. God is going to give them a resurrected new body that will burn for eternity. Their punishment is going to be eternal. This, this is why I do not want to go to hell, period. I, I don't even like to think about it. So then, so you look at verse 23, and it shall come to pass from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, all shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. That's us with our new bodies. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses. The carcasses are the resurrected, doomed, that God judges at the great white throne judgment, and he casts them into the lake of fire where their worm dieth not. And Jesus quoted this for a reason. He said, if thy, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. For it is better to thee to go into life maimed than to have two hands to go into hell where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. He quoted that, and that's two of the missing verses out of the ESV is when Jesus said that. He actually said that three times, and they took it out twice. So verse 24 they shall go forth, look upon the carcasses. This is the resurrected, eternal bodies of those who are doomed, damned to destruction and eternal punishment of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Now, the only thing that I can get from this, that what I see here is, God is going to allow us to look upon those who are in the lake of fire and say, I am glad that I am not in there. I mean, I'm just reading about it. And I'm glad that my sins have been forgiven and that I don't have to go to the lake of fire. And I, I just, if I, could, if I could save the world, I would. Because I don't want anybody to go to the lake of fire. Because it is forever. So I hope that, uh, I hope that answers your question. So you asked, is this in heaven? It's actually... In Revelation, we know that the new heaven and the new earth are going to be joined together because the new city, Jerusalem, new Jerusalem is going to come down from heaven onto the earth and God is going to be literally dwelling on the new earth with us. Okay? Heaven and earth will be joined together in that day. So there will be no difference really between heaven and earth we will be with our Father in his visible, be the first time man will ever lay eyes upon God the Father because of the resurrection. Um, this question, how can someone who dies be in heaven, but then it says the dead in Christ will rise first when he comes back? I have a theory. And it has to do with time and the measurement of time. I believe that the spiritual realm above where we are right now exists outside of linear time. So... A person dies, let's say a thousand years ago, a Christian dies a thousand years ago, and a Christian dies yesterday. We laid to rest Sister Linda Toomey 
I'm very saddened over her departure. I am very sad. I have been sad. She was such a sweet lady. Loved God. Loved God. All of us are going to show up at the same, I'm going to use the word time because I don't have another word. I, there is no time outside of this universe. And so their body rests in the ground, but their soul then leaves Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we know then that immediately we are taken. We know that what Jesus said about Lazarus. Lazarus was taken by angels to Abraham's bosom. So after our death, time is irrelevant, completely irrelevant. And it's, it's hard to hard to comprehend that and it's hard to explain it but that's kind of what I believe that since there is no measurement of time outside of this body and this earth and this world that we live in it's like everybody who has died in Christ shows up at the same time in the same place okay if that that's about as good that's about as good as I can render that one okay um let's see here i'm kind of going looking back and forth some were submitted sunday some were submitted today um this person sends matthew 24 26 wherefore if they shall say unto you behold he is in the desert go not forth behold he is in the secret chambers believe it not their comment is the new Bibles are based off Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. Christ is the word and they are saying the word was found in Sinai and the Vatican. Okay, there's no question there. All right. Um, let's see here. Let me go back. Here's one. What does, what does it mean exactly to blaspheme against the Holy Ghost? Okay. Um, I believe that we have an example of every doctrine. First of all, let's find the scripture. Blaspheme, asterisk. We'll find that verse. We know Jesus said, Matthew 12, 31, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now, there is a man in the Bible that, hang on, let me pull up the chapter. There's a man in the Bible who actually uh, did that. His name was Saul. I believe that Saul committed that unpardonable sin. The Holy Ghost now and the Word of God are not different entities. This is why John said in 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So, I believe Saul blasphemed the Holy Ghost in committing the sin that he committed in rejecting the word of the Lord. In 1 Samuel 15, um, Samuel gave a commandment to, the, to Saul. Samuel is the Bible. All the prophets in the Old Testament, when you're reading these stories, the prophet, if it's, a, if it's a good prophet, it's think of it as the Bible, okay? The Word of God, Jesus. A commandment was given to Saul that he was 
to go against these the city, kill the king, kill all the people, don't bring anything back. Well, that's not what Saul did. He was also told to wait. Saul didn't do that either. So he goes against, and, he, and this has been building up. You can see Saul getting a rebellious nature in him as you study the life of King Saul. Study his life. From the moment, from the moment he's anointed king, he's preaching and prophesying. He started out awesome, ended up in witchcraft, literally, with Endora from Bewitched. Because he talked to the woman who had a familiar spirit from Endor. And that's where they that's where the TV show writers got the name of Endora from Bewitched. They got it from the Bible. The witch of Endor. So Saul goes against the word of God. He builds up to it and he goes against the word of God. Rejects it. But he claims that he didn't do anything wrong. The the thing that the Holy Ghost does in our life, people, is convince us of sin. And judgment and godly sorrow and all of those things. That's the part that the, and while we're reading the scripture, the Holy Ghost is sitting there teaching us things and bringing other scripture to mind that we link together. And I mean, the Holy Spirit is a wonderful, wonderful thing to have in our lives. It's the third part of the Godhead, but it is linked with the word of God. So, in verse 13, Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners and the Malachites and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. He's twice now. He's refusing to repent. Refusing. Makes me think of these preachers that say, repentance is work salvation. You preach work salvation. You're, you're a false prophet. Are you kidding me? The Bible says godly saw work with repentance unto salvation. The scripture, people. Um, Saul said unto Samuel, verse 20, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone the, the way which the Lord had sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took the spoil. He's blaming it on. He's putting the blame on everybody else. The people did it. What kind of king is that? What kind of Congress and president gives billions and billions of dollars to all their cronies in other countries, but won't help their own people. Yeah. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord he hath also rejected thee from being king so I believe that Saul is an example or the example 
of someone blaspheming the Holy Ghost in the form of the Word of God in saying, I did what God said when clearly he didn't. Now watch this. So verse 24, Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. Samuel don't buy it. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. Now, when we look at Saul's death, um, let's see here, where is that? 1 Samuel, Saul died. I'm trying to find the verse where it says that, oh, yeah, 1 Chronicles 10, 13. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. So that's my understanding of it. I think Saul did that. I think he blasphemed the Holy Ghost in rejecting. He committed a transgression against the word of the Lord. What does, I mean, if we read uh, Revelation, the last words that Jesus said, about adding and taking away from the Word of God. Um, verse 18 of Revelation 22, I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So, uh, that's what I believe. I believe that the work of the Holy Spirit is always done in accordance with the Word of God. The Holy Spirit will never deviate from the words that are in this book. Never, 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 never do that. He will speak these words. He will direct our paths with these words. He will bring godly sorrow upon us with these words. That's his role. And he does not speak of himself. He speaks of Christ always, the word of God. So I believe the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is a rejection of the word of God. And do we not see that? everywhere. Um, here's another question. I was wondering if you could offer some commentary on an issue I have with a common interpretation of the he who overcomes verses in Revelation. It was my interpretation that the verses which use this term are directed at Christ's own entity in some mystic way. I was surprised to learn that many Christians interpret these passages. It was directed toward themselves. I have many issues with this common interpretation, but the biggest logical issue, aside from a parent, aside from apparent theological issues, is something approxim approximating how can believers be on the throne of, and he puts letters Y-H-W-H, Yeshua. His name is Jehovah. His name is Jesus. Yet also be around it. This reminds me of an Islamic problem raised by David Wood, where because of different sources, they cannot determine where Allah dwells, either on his throne or above his throne. 
succinctly, my question is, on the throne or around the throne? And he quotes, he gives two verses. Revelation 3.21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Revelation 4.4, 4, And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, um, I don't, here, here's how I'm going to answer that question. Um, we know that when Christ returns, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Um, let's see here. Yeah, okay. Revelation 20, verse 4. In fact, let's get, let's get the context. Revelation 20, verse 1. I saw an angel. This is after um, the battle of Armageddon. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him, and that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. I saw thrones, they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned, they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and Christ, shall reign with him a thousand years. So in verse 4 he says, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them. So, during the thousand years, the reign of Christ, he's coming with ten thousands. The number ten is the number for dominion. You have the first king in Genesis 10. You have the first kingdom in Genesis 10. The law is the Ten Commandments. Paul said that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. So the number 10 is for dominion. So here's Christ, a thousand years, which is 10 times 10 times 10. We, uh, there's an example of this. When Jethro went to Moses and said, look, Moses, not wise that you're sitting and you're hearing every little court case. Why don't you set up people that will help you? Thus came the what's now referred to as the Sanhedrin, the 70. There were 70 men. The Holy Spirit fell upon them, came upon them, and they became the judges over the house of Israel. So you have Moses, the head judge, the chief judge, justice and you had the elders these elder men who were full of the holy ghost who were also ruling over the people of israel and they were doing it by the book now obviously that all turned bad but it was the example of what takes place during the thousand year reign when we come back with christ we will be in resurrected bodies, which means that we will not hunger, we will not be thirsty, we will not want the lusts that accompany the flesh, we will be as the angels, full of power and might, 
We will not be afraid of the faces of men. They can't kill us. So ask yourself the question, why do some judges go bad? Well, some of them go bad because of money. They get caught up. They want more money. They take bribes or sometimes gangs or other politicians say, well, you know, we'll kill you. We'll kill your family on and on and on. And they rule. How did how did Biden steal this whole election? He didn't do it by himself. He had judges on his side. There's no doubt in my mind about it. When we judge with Christ, we will be on thrones on this earth, ruling with Christ over this earth. I don't know where I'm going to be. I'd like to be in Alaska because I really like Alaska. But we will be ruling with Christ a thousand years and we will rule with perfect judgment because we'll have the word of God in us. We'll know the law and we won't be afraid of the faces of men. We can't be bribed. We can't be, um, we can't be tempted by anything to judge falsely because we are now brand new resurrected bodies. We will be perfected in a perfected state. That is going to be the government of this world. So that's my answer. And that comes to those who overcome. Overcome what? Everything. Overcome the sins of this world, the temptations of this world, overcome the trial. I had it in my mind today, I was going to talk about the fiery trial. And I re remembered I was going to answer questions, but there is a fiery trial coming that's going to try those who say, I believe in Jesus Christ. And many people, I'm afraid, are going to be found guilty of not believing what they said they believed. But there are those who are going to overcome. God is going to help them. Remember what I read earlier. God's going to fix it to where we won't be afraid. And I'm waiting for that day to come where I will not be afraid ever again. I'll not be afraid of the faces of men. I'll not be afraid to preach certain things because it might hurt some people's feelings. Or people will get mad at me. And they'll, they'll not watch anymore. They won't come to church here anymore. I get afraid. But in that resurrection, when I get that new body... I won't be afraid anymore. There's a fiery trial coming. It's, it's, and I may talk about this Thursday. All right? So I hope that helps um, that question. Here we go. Here's another one. This is from Sunday. I have a question about going to heaven. I understand that in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, it says we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. But in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, it says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. So my question is that when brothers and sisters in Christ die, do we go directly to heaven immediately or do we not go to heaven until the dead in Christ? So that actually, I think, I tried to answer with the previous, you asked the same question that somebody else did. And I think it's a time issue. I think that once you die, time stops. I don't believe in what's called soul sleep, that the soul lays in the grave until the Lord appears. So again, nearly impossible to explain because everything about our way of thinking revolves around time. Time is linked to every part of our existence. And to consider something that 
does not involve time, we cannot comprehend it. But I think that's the answer. All right, uh, let's see here. Um, Hello, Pastor Mike. The continental divide of the massive landmass scientists call Pangaea. Let me explain that part. I believe in Genesis 1 and, Gen well, let, let me go to Genesis 11. Genesis 11. Well, I'll, I'll, let, I'll read Genesis 1. Uh, in the creation, on the second day of creation. Verse 9, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, the gathering together waters called he sees, and God saw that it was good. So I believe that on day two of creation, God brought forth a dry land mass, one. And then he had the seas. The question is, was the divide of the continents caused by the flood and its receding waters, as some apologists theorize, or the result of a specific event, Genesis 10, 25, when it mentions in Peleg's day? Um, and I appreciate what you said after that. I'm not going to read your name, but I appreciate uh, your love and your prayers for our ministry. Um uh, I'm going to have to go with the only thing that I can go with, and that is in Peleg's day, the earth was divided. There, there must have been something that happened because in, the reason why I brought up Genesis 11 is that it says the whole earth, remember the, the one land mass in Genesis 1 is called the earth and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech so uh, and then in Hebrews 10 or he, not Hebrews 10 Genesis 10 in the days of Peleg he was called Peleg because the earth was divided in his days so something happened Was it a meteorite? Was it, I don't know. We were not told that. And my thing is, if we're not told something specifically in the Bible by God, it doesn't have, really, it really doesn't matter. God says, worry about what I wrote instead of what I didn't write. But he did mention in the days of Peleg that the earth was divided. So I would have to go with what I have as far as scripture is concerned. When Peleg was born, something happened and the continents broke apart. God separated, you know, this, we have a, we have a model here between Genesis 10 and 11 of number one, God dividing everybody, first of all, by, um, uh, speech, Genesis 10, God dividing everybody by families and tribes, and Genesis 10, God dividing everybody by land. Now the continents, you know, South America fits in with Africa, just looks that way. So I think during that time, God literally separated everybody from everybody else, scattered them out all over the place and said, no more of this trying to reach into heaven stuff, which that's what we're doing now by International Space Station, putting something on the moon, going to Mars. Now we are seriously talking about the idea of warping space so that we can go to other places in the heavens. They're working on the technology as we speak, believe it or not. Um, here's a question. I've got a few minutes left. Um, my first question is, I think you answered it during the morning sermon, but it's 
It's what do you tell people who claim that the Bible is just a book written by men and has been revised and mistranslated to meet their purposes and to control people? That it's man's words, not God's words. My mother and members of my family believe this and dismiss my belief and trust in the word. Dismiss my belief and my trust in the word of the Lord. How do I deal with my own family's unbelief of God's word? They believe in God, but they do not read or believe in God's word. Okay. Uh, let me read something else here. Also, my brother said one Sunday that he doesn't believe that someone can, can, can commit such heinous crimes like rape, murder, sexual assault of a child and ask for forgiveness and he or she is forgiven by Jesus and will go to heaven. That's not true. All manner. Let me, let me read that verse. All manner of, I think it's sin, yep, Matthew 12, 31, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. All. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. The, and what I would tell you in answering that question is quote scriptures for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanses from all unrighteousness all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men um, for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord Romans 10 9 and 10 uh, and, and, I, and I went, to, you mentioned Sunday that I, I went down through the Romans road. Now, on the word of God issue, where you, you're saying your family doesn't believe the Bible because they say it was written by men, translated for political purposes or whatever to make it say what they wanted it to say. The only way to answer that is with Scripture. Now, I understand that's the part that they don't believe. So, if you're asking me, is there another way to convince them that the Word of God is, in fact, the Word of God or the words of God, the answer is, there is no better way to say it than the Word of God. Because when you give them a scripture answer, and if they reject that, they're not rejecting you. They're doing what Saul did, rejecting God. And that, that applies to everything. I've had calls from, I remember one time um, a, a woman called, she had a rebellious daughter, and she wanted advice on how to bring her back to the Lord. And just in listening to her, it sort of seemed like she wanted me to give her and I'm, I'm not trying to be ignorant about this, but like magic words to say that it would snap her out of it and she would come back. The thing is, people, all the years I've been in the ministry, I've seen children grow up in Christian homes gone to Christian school or homeschooled and literally turned into devils by the time they reached 20 years old. It happens. And the way this world is right now, it's, it is destroy. It is eating up children. I almost like want to tell people don't have any more kids, not in this world. But I know 
kids are a blessing. But anyway, if the if they won't listen to Scripture, so you you read them, you know, Second um, Peter. Chapter 1, verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as into a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time, but by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And if you want more verses... Um, the video I did called, um, which Bible you be the judge. Another one called the case for a perfect Bible. Another one called Satan's greatest enemy. They all deal with the Bible translation issue. And I give the literally scores of verses that prove that God's word is absolutely what it says it is. It is the words of God's own mouth given to men who wrote them down faithfully. They were preserved. They were translated correctly. 1 Corinthians 14 tells us that. They were translated perfectly. And once you give them the Bible answer and they reject that, there literally is nothing else that you can do to, to convince them. God may give you something to say. God may lay something on your heart, a way to present what I just read to you and the scriptures. But if God can't convince them, you can't either. And the truth of it is, there are no... I use the term magic words. I don't, I can't really think of anything, a better way of saying it. Maybe like proof positive words. They, it's like they think that if they say just the right words, they'll convince everybody of how wrong they are. And the truth of it is, some people are going to perish some people in our families are going to perish without believing in God, trusting in his word. And it's sad to say that. It is sad to think about that. It brings great distress when we think about how people are turning their backs on God every day. And we try everything to bring them back. And in some cases, they're just not coming back. So you give them the word of God. And if they reject that, maybe, maybe let it soak in a while. Pray for them every day. This room was built by a man that I prayed for, that I wanted to know that he was saved. And God answered that prayer better than I prayed it. But at first, I didn't think, I didn't think he was going to. I thought it just wasn't going to happen. But you wait on the Lord. You trust him. You give the word of God, then you step back and you let God do what God's going to do. But understand, not everybody, not everybody who hears the word receives eternal life. And that's the tragedy of this world that we live in. The people that we love, some of them are going to perish in the lake of fire. Sad as it is to say that, that's how it's going to be. I want you to pray for me. Uh-oh. Hang on. I'm not done yet. 
I want you to pray for me. I'm trying to put together the next Watchman broadcast. I'm really struggling with it. And it's going to deal with the Roman Catholic doctrine of the wafer Jesus, the Eucharist. So, And I'm, I'm having a hard time putting it all together. That's why I haven't come out with it yet. Pray for me. Maybe that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know. But help me, help me pray about that, all right? God bless you. I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do. We're buying food now for the people of Kenya. We're going to do another feeding this week. And we're still planning on a permanent place to do that. So continue to pray for us and love the people of Kenya. And in everything, think Bible.